morning, church. So first, I'd just like to thank the leadership team here at Freedom and also Samuel for the amazing opportunity that they've provided the youth today. Um, I've had the opportunity to work with Samuel. Thank you. So I've had the opportunity to work with Samuel for a few weeks, few months now, and just what he's done for the youth has been incredible. So just a round of applause for him, please. So today, I'm speaking about something that I've brought up in church before, just over a month ago now. A few of you may remember, back when we were on the field, a few of us were asked to give our testimonies about the Christian Youth Camp New Day. And I said, the New Day was the first time I truly experienced the presence of God. Maybe it was the fact that I just came out such a real experience at New Day that made me say what I said. But the truth is, I wasn't seeing the full picture when I stepped onto stage a few months ago. My preach and testimony today relates to Esther 4 verse 14, which says, For if you remain silent at this time, Relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to a royal position for such a time as this. For those of you who don't know, I've been head boy of Victoria College since April of this year. Thank you. And it's been great so far. Being a leader is quite a gratifying experience, and since I've stepped into the role, I've become used to a lot of things, such as public speaking, for example. But, although it seems like a long time ago, it was only a year ago now when I didn't even think I was going to apply for head boy. When you think of a typical student leader, you usually envision someone that participates in almost everything the school has to offer. Someone who excels in academics and either sports or music. At the beginning of year 12, although I was academically sound and the best at one sport in particular, I didn't exactly have that much going for me. On the other hand, some students were on the student interview panel or were incredibly skilled at multiple instruments and were well known by staff for their expertise. So you can see why, at the start of year 12, I didn't really think I was going to put in a serious application for head boy. However, throughout my first two terms, piece after piece started to fall into place, which got me to where I am today. Before I explain exactly what happened, I'd like to remind you of something else that's been brought up in church before. A few weeks ago, Debbie brilliantly opened a new series looking at the book of Esther. Now something she said while she was preaching and I was watching online stood out to me as if it was a parallel to something I'd experienced. The book of Esther is a book of coincidences and Debbie describes God in this book as being behind the scenes working all things for his purposes. Now let's take ourselves back to year 12. It wasn't long into the year before the thought of seriously putting in an application for head boy came about. Coincidentally, my form tutor happened to be head of the Ahmed house. And for those of you who don't know, a form tutor is someone who spends 25 minutes with you each school day. This tutor in particular was in the most senior role possible for a form tutor and was particularly passionate about seeing her students do well. So one of the first days of school, as I'm sat in the corner, she tells me, you are going to be head boy. Now I kind of just sat there and thought, just leave me alone. <laughs> because honestly, I don't like expectations that seem unattainable. And at that point of the entire form present, it just seemed like an expectation that had likely failed to me. However, God also gave me the sometimes great ability of being reluctant to say no. So I said, sure miss, I'll go for it. Another thing about me is that when I agree to do something, I usually commit to doing it. So from now on, I was committed to getting the role. Over the months to follow, things tend to get a bit political, which is weird in a school environment. And as you know about politics, a lot of factors come into play. This was just one example of where looking back at my journey, I noticed a coincidence of time and place, similar to those seen in the book of Esther. Esther 4.14 focuses on the fact that Esther became a queen at a pivotal point in history for the relief and deliverance of the Jews to arise. Although the situation of saving the Jews and getting a role at school are vastly different, Esther 4.14 mentions God, or shows God using his power to put Esther in the right position for relief and deliverance of the Jews without directly mentioning God. I could go over several of these coincidences that all played a role in getting me to where I am today, but unfortunately, I have a time limit. God works in mysterious ways, and we don't always fully understand his timing. Isaiah 55, verse 8 to 9 says, 
For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and your thoughts than my thoughts. Some of you might be looking back at where you are now and realizing that maybe God put you there for a reason, like I believe God put me here for a reason. Some of you might be in a challenging period in your life, a lot more meaningful than a role at school. You might not be able to, you might not be able to see how God is currently working in your life. But to you, I say, you may not know the mind of God, but you can trust that he has a plan for you. Sometimes he works behind the scenes to help us learn to turn to him and desire a relationship with him. Other times he's teaching us how to walk in faith. And other times he's concealing his purpose until the appointed time. The important thing is that you try your best to cling to hope during difficult times and know that God is indeed working. I'd like to invite the band as I conclude my preach. I'd like to read to you Romans 8 verse 28, which says, Do not despair when difficult times occur, for we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And as we stand, I'd just like to pray for us as we close. Dear Lord, I pray for all those standing in this room. I pray that this notion of I dissipates, dear Lord, and it's the place of God. I got this promotion. I achieved this award. I did this. I did that. And instead, it's God got me this promotion. God gave me this award. God did this and God did that. Not to diminish what these people have achieved, but for them to go away and understand that you have been working in their lives, you are currently working in their lives, and you will continue to work in their lives. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. My name is Vicky, as Tino said, and I'm 11 years old, and I'm here to encourage people my age. And today I'll be preaching Jeremiah 17, verse 14, a prayer for healing. Heal me, O Lord, and I will be healed. Save me, and I will be saved. For you, you are the one I praise. Jeremiah's heartfelt pleas emphasizes the profound belief in God's power to heal and save. It's a reminder to place our faith and trust in his divine intervention during times of sickness. What does this mean, you may ask? Well, this means that you should always keep your faith and hope up, even if things don't work. God if God doesn't answer your prayers, don't assume that he's not there. Just wait and your prayers will be answered. God is our light and our hope. For him we must trust and believe. He sacrificed himself to take away our sins. God is our father and our lifesaver. Without him, we are nobody and nothing. And before I leave, I've got a fantastic testimony about my close friend Magda. She had cancer. It was triple negative. The first one she had was breast cancer and she got cured. Then the second one came more and more aggressive. It came in her bones and the liver. The doctor said that there's nothing else to do and she had little time left, but God has cured her. The doctor even said that the cancer is inactive, but now we believe that God has cured her forever and amen. amen. Good morning, uh, how's everyone doing? <laughs> uh, I'm Marlo, for those, of you, for those of you who do not know me. And today I've chosen to do a preach about God's love for the youth takeover. I've always felt from God this massive heaviness on my heart due to God's love ever since I've been a Christian. However, before I dive into this preach, I would like, to keep, I would like you to keep a part of John chapter 15, verse 12 to 13 in your minds. My command is this, love one another as I've loved you. As I was thinking about what to write for my first preach, God's everlasting, direct, uh, God's everlasting love directly came not only onto my mind, but my, heart, but my heart also. I thought it'd be great to share how much God loves us, but also what happens to us when we become a Christian and how God commands us to act towards one another in the context of loving one another. I would like to divert your attention to Romans chapter 5, verse 8. But God shows us his love for, 
But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For me personally, that brings me such tranquility. Just knowing that God, loved, God loves us so abundantly that he died for us even when we were sinners and not living up to God's standard and rebelling against God daily. Yet God would go above and beyond, and, uh, God would go above and beyond for us and, uh, to ensure that we would have everlasting life with him. Even when we couldn't meet God's standard, God went above and beyond for us. I find God's love especially beautiful through what God tells us in, again, Romans chapter 8, verse 38 to 39. For I'm convinced neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in, that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. God is expressing to us through this verse that no matter what we do, Nothing can separate us from God's unconditional and everlasting love. Personally, this speaks to me deeply, as nothing else in this world will love you unconditionally. And in, the, in those moments when you need God, his love is always something you can rely on. And, and again, is something you will not get from this world. Amen. God, God's love is true. And when you think about it, the only love. So to allow people to feel true love, we must as Christians show them God's love. The point of me expressing how much God loves us all unconditionally and perfectly is that how can we as individuals, uh, how can we as individual people spread this love that we feel so deeply to other people? God exhibits how we can do this in again, John chapter 15, verse 12 to 13. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one uh, than this, to lay down one's life for one's friend. First, I would like to emphasize how here God tells us that loving one another as he has loved us is a command and not a suggestion. In order to achieve this love for one another, we must be slow to anger and slow to judging one another, but rather always loving one another as God has loved us, even when we have disobeyed God. No matter the differences we have with people, we must always first listen to God's command, which is to love others just as God loves us. I say this because the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. So if there's one thing to take away from my preach today, let it be this question. What is stopping you from becoming one of God's workers and spreading God's true love? Now I'd like to just go on to my testimony. So as you may know, the young people went to a New Day festival uh, back in July, end of July. Um, and it was absolutely amazing. Samuel's always told me, oh, the Holy Spirit works in many various and amazing ways. Uh, I've told my friends about it who aren't Christians, and they've, they've been, they didn't think it was true. That, start to, that, that mindset started to nearly creep into my mind. However, at New Day, uh, halfway through New Day, the Holy Spirit struck me just where I was and showed me God's true love. It was absolutely amazing. I started crying. Um, I have no clue what even happened. The Holy Spirit just came completely over me. And it was absolutely, absolutely an amazing experience. <laughs> the reason why I'm telling you this also is God's true love was expressed that night. Some of the boys here may remember the holy huddle. <laughs> um, it was absolutely amazing. We were all praying for each other. We were all talking to each other. All, we were all getting really deep into each other's lives and seeing where, what has God done, to, done for us in each other's lives. And for me, that is absolutely beautiful, and that is God's love. Amen. I would like us to all stand to our feet and just pray. Pray about something that we've heard today. It may be in your mind that you're thinking about, yeah, that really touched me in my heart there. And uh, I'd ask if the worship team could come up as we pray. Let's pray. God, I thank you for all these people that are standing in this room. I just pray that they can, they can really feel your love. If anyone hasn't felt your love, God, please just strike them with the Holy Spirit now. Give them, give them your love. Give them your true love that, that you have. Not, not, the, not the love that the, world, that the world wants to give them, 
but the, the true love that, that you have for them, God. The, God that, the, the love that will never end. The love that is everlasting and beautiful and perfect and has no flaws and never fails. I pray, Lord. Thank you, God, for being you. Thank you, God, for being the good God. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.